teachers. I am a secondary school teacher and I'm used to doing assemblies, but I'm not used to speaking to big children, so I'm imagining that you've all got little ties on. And I've put my reading glasses on so I can't actually see you. So, <laughs> so uh, I might need to warm up a little bit. Uh, I teach food technology, which is a lovely job for an autistic person because it's all about routines and it's all about being accurate and it's really great. And the kids will ask you questions like, can I have an egg? And you go, yes, you can have an egg. It's great. Life is very black and white. Uh, the other part of my job is to uh, deliver the PSHE curriculum, which I was very surprised I enjoyed and that's the only reason why I said I would do tonight was because I thought if I can deliver a PSHE curriculum in a secondary school and talk about condoms and puberty. I could talk about anything, I'm sure. So, um, uh, what has it meant to me? Well, I think that sums it up, really. We all, I am a cliched autistic person. I do like my uh, cartoon characters. I am autistic, and I do find... find. So, how did it come about? This was my diagnosis. I was a secondary school teacher, and I volunteered for every bit of training that was available. I like to learn. I now know why I like to learn a lot. And I was sat in some training down in a classroom and I watched this. We were finding out about the children that I was working with that were on the spectrum and we're watching this. And I'm watching this and I'm thinking there's a rectangle. If that was a door, that would be a health and safety nightmare. Surely that door should open inwards. Oh, the big triangle. I reckon I could get 60 triangles into that, re into that box. Yeah, if I was to pattern them up and down, I could do that. What the bloody hell is that circle doing? What is, why? Why would you put a circle in there? There's lovely straight lines. I love triangles. I really love triangles. So I'm watching it thinking, what the chuffing hell is that circle doing? What is going on? Why are they doing that? So I'm sitting there thinking that, and then afterwards we were all discussing it, and everyone was going... There was a mummy triangle, and there was a baby triangle, and the mummy triangle didn't want the baby triangle to play with the circle. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you can get 60 triangles into that box, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> and I really, and then I went, shit, sorry I was swear, shit, I'm on the spectrum, I really am. So I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to talk to somebody. And luckily, a very lovely friend of ours, who I'm going to talk to my friends were, a lovely friend of ours, Tanya, had stepped up as the special education needs coordinator at school. And I'd worked with her doing the personal social health education. So I went to Tanya, I said, can I make you a cup of tea and ask you a really big question? She said, you can make me a cup of tea and ask me a really big question. And I said, do you think I'm on the autism spectrum? And she said, no. I don't think you are. I know you're on the spectrum. <laughs> and I went, oh, oh okay. Um, but she watched. The, the good thing about that was it was black and white because she knew I needed it to be black and white. I'm really not good with grey areas. I'm really not good at all. So I thought, well, okay, Tanya, Auntie Tanya thinks I'm special. I need to go and find out about this. So classic sort of autism thing. I went off and I became the internet guru on, on autism. And I was reading it all, and all of it didn't make any bloody sense. It didn't. None of it did. Because it was all of this sort of stuff. And it was all, you know, it's a disorder, you have problems with social communication, social interaction, something. Well, I don't know, I'm a bloody secondary school teacher. I'm not autistic. Of course I can't be. I can deal with children all of the time. And then some of it really angered me. You know, because it keeps, I, I, I am, I'm on the camp of disorder being the wrong thing. It's, it's not the right word. And you do find that there are almost cliches, diagnoses. And that was the one that really, really infuriated. If any of you had someone playing trumpet in your ear, you'd have a bloody sensory issue, wouldn't you? And that, that made me so angry. And I was thinking, well, anybody would find that difficult. If they'd shown somebody else's raincoat swooshing, that and, and that being it, but it was the fact that they choose, and I think, again, that's me with the literal interpretation of those images. So I, I tried to find some online tests, because I thought, well, I'll do the test, and I'll, it, like Cosmopolitan, I'll find out if I am actually, you know, on the spectrum. And they were all really aimed at children, and I thought, this isn't me, I am not autistic. I am really, and... 
because I just thought I was mental. I just thought, that's it, you are mental. That's what's wrong with you. You're, not, you're tapped in the head, it's not right. And it went like that. And then what I did was, I fell inwards. I fell inwards and I took my world with me because I didn't like the outside world. And I could cope with the children in the classroom and getting to the classroom was a problem and I could cope with it. And my world got smaller. And these lovely people here are my friends and they've come to support me. And I shrunk away from them because I couldn't go to the pub. I'd always gone to the pub and smoked, so I'd gone outside for a fag and things, so I'd had my coping mechanisms. But suddenly I couldn't even do those things. And it's because I was battling with knowing whether I was autistic or just thinking I was mental. All right? And I know that's a really horrible word, but I didn't know how else to label myself at. And I really genuinely, and it got to the stage where my bedroom, I could go to my classroom and I could be in my car and I could be in my bedroom. And that's when you think to yourself, do you know, you have to do something out about this because it's not, even if you're mental, this isn't normal behaviour. This isn't normal mental behaviour. There's something wrong here in, in what you're doing. And I did luckily have a light bulb moment. It was beautiful. Trolling the internet at three o'clock in the morning, I should be heavily, then I wake up for a few hours. And then I go back to sleep really heavily. And I'm like, tick, tick, tick. And I could write you a story about each one of those. And that was the moment when I knew I was autistic. And that still, you can tell how excited I get every time I look at that. And when I'm feeling like I'm mental, I read that and I remind myself that I'm not mental. But I didn't know how to make that to them. Or to them, or to them, or to them, or to them. I didn't know how to put that across. And then I found something else. I honestly, you probably read it, but I love this book. And um, because it is just how I function in the world. It's an amazing book. Um, and it's about this woman, and she's autistic. And she explains about her being autistic. And she's given me a vocabulary to explain about it. Like, I come in here tonight, and it was really nice, because I said, I'm really nervous, can I take my shoes off? And everyone went, yeah, that's fine. Go to school and you say, can I take my shoes off? Because I'm nervous. Everyone goes, weirdo. Why do you want to take your shoes off? Because I need to be on the ground. But you've got your shoes on the ground. No, I haven't. I haven't got my feet on the ground. And I can't explain it, but that book does a lot of explaining. So, I will info drunk. You got me. So, Elizabeth said to me, I should tell you what it was like getting a diagnosis. Mine was very similar to Lynn's, but different. Um, I didn't get the tests. Um, so, I had read all of these things, and when I saw that, I thought, right, I am autistic. I've got that spectrum. So, I phoned the doctor's surgery, and for me, the doctors are doctor's surgery. The lovely thing about it is you don't have to go there anymore. You don't have to go to the orange waiting room with all the sick people coughing and smelling and all of that rustling and dirty magazines. You don't have to do that anymore. They phone you. So for me, the telephone consultation is a lifeline. So they phoned me up and I was talking to a very nice GP and I told her my story. And she said, I'll refer you through to the adult autism unit. Be prepared for a big wait. It's seriously underfunded. They weren't really joking. Really weren't joking. So I received a letter and I didn't get any tests or anything. Oh, maybe I did get some tests and I've just blanked it out and I sent them back. Um, and I received a letter and the, the Ministry of Taking Things literally <coughs> took over with me. And that was the letter said, and it's etched in big red writing in my head, we will contact you soon. Soon. The magic word, lovely Morrissey said, how soon is now? Uh, it's, it's 18 months, that's how quickly soon is. Um, and I think I got bumped up the list because I'm like you, I really will phone them. When is soon? When is soon? Could you please explain soon to me? When is soon? And then, when I, and then my life started doing that again. And I went off work, and I stayed off work because I couldn't get to work because I started getting phobic about getting out of my green bedroom and going in my red car to go to work. And I didn't like going in the red car to get to work, and it was because it was red. And I only bought a blue car because I didn't want to be in a red car. And I thought, this isn't right. I need to push. So I started pushing, um, and I got bumped up the list. 
So I, um, so that's kind of how I got to the adult unit. When I went there, I was not really sure what I was expecting, and I thought I was going to have to take some tests. I'd watched some programmes on the telly and they seemed to make people do puzzles. And I thought, oh, I love a puzzle and I'll be good at this and be really competitive. And then I went through this class yes. by failing at them or do you have to be able to do them? <laughs> so I was there thinking, oh my God, do I have to fail at this? Do I have to do this? And I got there and I was so unprepared for it. It was just a chat over a cup of tea. That was it. It was all it was. With a woman who understood <coughs> that I might not like the room I was going into. And that was lovely for me. She went, we can do stuff with the lights. We can do stuff with the sounds. We can move the chairs. We can give you a different chair. We can give you a cushion to sit on. And she was all just about, what, what do you want? What? And I was so shocked to be with somebody that understood that I might have sensory issues. I was, it, was, it almost shut me down because I didn't know what to do with it, because it was so lovely. And I was trying to sit on my hands so I didn't hug her. So I'm sitting there like, going, I am not going to hug her because she's so lovely and she understands that I have issues. I mean, walk afterwards, I was so fatigued. It took me, I don't know, two or three days to get over it afterwards. Because you have to talk about everything. And you don't realise until you're talking about it that sitting under a tree for three years of your childhood making Stone Age settlements in the mud in the pouring rain is odd. Until someone says to you, do you know, making Stone Age settlements, did you interact with anyone else? Yes, I was interacting with the mud. Uh, and then you start to realise that, you know, and you go, oh yeah, I'm not mental, I'm really out there. Um, so I found it... Um, I don't know, it was odd, it was really odd, um, and it was kind of what I wanted, I wanted a label, I think, I quite wanted a badge, because I didn't have a badge that suited me, I tried all sorts of things when I was younger, um, and then I got the letter, and the letter was lovely, the letter literally blew my world out, because it was there, hallelujah, and do you know what, I was so cathartic, I just went out, and, I went out and out of myself, to went, hello, I'm autistic, I'm out of breath, isn't it great, isn't it amazing, and everyone went, yeah, yeah, and get on with it. You've still got to teach, you've still got to mark, you've still got to do this. And it was that that, <coughs> that that was the bit that really shocked me. I thought it might be. And particularly because I worked in a school where we deal with autistic children. And the, the hardest part for me was being with a bunch of adults that read every, virtually every term information about how to support um, children with various special educational needs. And none of them could apply it to me. So I would go into a room, and this room's lovely because it's got diffused lighting, and I would go into a room, this is a bank of lights, I'll take the front lights out and I'll just keep the back lights on. Or if the children need the lights on, I'll put my gigs on or something and I'll just make the lighting different. But I actually work with people that will go in, into a room knowing I'm autistic and go, oh it's very dull in here, and put all the lights on. And you just think, it just takes a moment's thought. But, you know, that's kind of... I didn't disclose to my parents because I genuinely believe my father is way up on the spectrum. I also think my dad has a such attachment disorder. He was bombed during the war and I think he has lots of issues. And I didn't want to tell my parents that I'm autistic because I think they would beat themselves up about it. But everybody else, I'm kind of out and proud about it because I feel it just allows me a licence to be myself um, in a lot of ways. It's... Being diagnosed um, has made me understand how my brain works. So I'm going to try and illustrate how my brain works for you. Bear with. Okay? And some year eight boys taught me how to do slides. So big up to me year eight boys that taught me how to do that. Why didn't you explore all those those? And I'm sitting there thinking, how have they come to that conclusion really quickly? So if we have to problem solve around a big table like that on the training day, I've got the problem, I'm analysing the problem, and I'm working out what all the possible solutions are. I get them all lined up, put all my ducks lined up in a row like that, and then I start looking at each of the ducks. And then I start doing it. So it's more like this. This is how my brain will work. I'll go, problem, oh, that's interesting. Boring, interesting, interesting. Oh, look, I found the answer to the problem. Um, but I know... What I find is that I know more about the problem than the other people around me because I've looked at every sort of 
facet of it. And I have to do that. And people, <coughs> some people accept that you want to do that. And some people get really frustrated when they start, they make a sentence, like I've written down about three things I'm going to ask you about afterwards. Because I want to know what they are, and because I can't move on if I don't know the word. And that's why I think I had education problems at secondary school, because um, it was very much by rote in the late, the early 1970s. And I got to I before E except after C. And when I said why, they couldn't tell me, and I stopped learning how to spell at that point because it didn't make any sense. And I understand that I like to know why, and then give me why, and then I'll move on and I'll learn it. Um, so I'm very much, uh, I, and I get stuck, and I call it buffering, and in secondary school children will allow you to do this. I'll actually stand there and physically buffer at them because they understand what I'm doing. I don't know what's happening. I need a moment. I'm going to have a little buffer here and you'll, I'll get back on track and everything will be grand. One of the other things I've really learned to understand is eyes. I don't like eyes. I don't know why I don't like eyes. And eye contact gets me into quite a lot of trouble because I don't like doing it. And if you don't know me or you do know me, I don't really make eye contact with you. And I tend to look down like that. I'm trying really hard to look at people's eyebrows, but then I get a bit fixated about wanting to pluck them or brush them or why are they there and what do they do. Um, so I get a bit confused by eyes. Um, and then I tend to look down. And I have noticed that if people don't know me very well. They don't realise I'm looking down. I think they think I'm looking at their boobs. And I'm not. I'm generally not looking at anyone's boobs or their shoes or anything else. I'm just desperately not trying to make eye contact with you. And so, again, bless my year eights. I do love them. Um, they found me a picture of really horrible eyes. And that's what looking at eyes, I have to get rid of it straight away. Uh, that's what looking at ordinary eyes feels like. I rip it into four, so I've got four pieces of A5 paper. And I live my life with bits of A5 ripped up paper. I'll have to recycle it. I've got two lumps of blue tack on my theory wall, and that's where my flat nav goes, and that's the flat nav for my life, and I have a list every day, don't I? Every single day I have a list. If I've got a lot of things to do, they get stuck on the doors, so that I know what I'm doing with my day. Sometimes if the list gets messy, I screw it up and I have to have a new list. Sometimes I like a list of lists. Um, I do like them. I do use lots of paper. Um, <coughs> And I'm really, really, really rubbish at prioritising things. So I do everything now. If you've got to do something, you do it now. And the classic example of that is we get <coughs> emails at work that say, the Year 8 reports are due in two weeks. So I write the Year 8 reports. <coughs> Peter sent me the email. Now. Because I don't, can't do two weeks. I can't do it. I've tried really hard to do that, and I can't do that. I can't, if someone says there's a meeting, do you want to attend? I go and research what the topic's about, send them lots of information, then tell them I don't want to attend. But I have to do the research to understand why I don't want to go. So I'm really, really bad at that. And then if it doesn't make any sense, because um, I have to put some cliched references in here, uh, if it doesn't make any sense, then I'm there buffering. You know, why it's, you know, it can't be, I don't understand, and then I'm there, and I don't know which bit of the problem to look at, so I'll just stand there, and I will just blank out, and I will just sit, and I will just close down, and if it goes on long enough, if somebody doesn't butt in and explain it to me in a way that I can understand it, I will close in, and close down, and it's, it's like your battery, someone pulls your battery out of you, and you literally, once you start going down, you can't stop it. And sometimes you're sort of desperately trying to claw it and stay awake and stay with it, but you can't. A very similar um, thing is about the people's reactions. If you say that you're autistic, they say, you can't be autistic, you've got a sense of humour. And it, but it's a very literal sense of humour, and I love it. I absolutely <coughs> love a literal sense of humour. Um, and also, I'm a very good... Um, audience for very quick-witted people, and I also like really childish jokes. This one's one of Kathy's. Uh, two aerials got married, uh, met on a roof, fell in love, got married. The ceremony was rubbish, but the reception was brilliant. So that's my sort of humour, um, and I do utterly, utterly love it. Um, and I do realise that I like the sort of uh, backwards and forwards of it all. 
And when I look back at my time before my diagnosis with teaching, some of the best lessons I've ever had have always been with the autistic children. And I think that's because we were able to um, institutionalise ourselves or routine ourselves. And there was a lovely lad who I taught for three years, food tech, and he hated food and he hated touching food <coughs> and he hated everything. And his TA that came along with him, his teacher assistant, was a stand-up comedian. And he was utterly brilliant. And every lesson, George and I would start it the same way. And he would roll his, want to roll his sleeves up, and he couldn't do his button. So he would just come and present his hand at me like this. <coughs> and I would say, would you like a hand with that, George? And he'd go, no, I've got two. And we started every lesson like that. And we went on. And I, lo I thought I was doing it to entertain George. I'm sure George was doing it to entertain me. So we buffered it on for about 27 weeks. And in the last lesson, his TA said, would you like some assistance with that? And me and George just looked at each other like that. Where's the joke? He's taken our joke away from us. And I really felt genuinely robbed of my joke. And it was like... So, yeah, uh, the other thing that I really struggle with is taking things literally, uh, and it does cause me to have problems. A sort of good example of that is our kids carry a behavioural card, and so they've got this little card in their pocket, and if they do anything wrong on the corridor, like not tuck their shirt in or be on their mobile phones, teachers can sign their cards, and they get three signatures and they get detention. It's sort of like a controlling mechanism. And one of the things that they have to do is carry their card. So if you say to them, where's your card, and they haven't got a card, you can give them a detention for them not having a card. I don't quite understand the system, anyway. Um, so, kid arrives, form time, smelling lovely, because the blazer's been washed, and says, my mum washed my blazer, but all the cards were in it, and they dissolved. I went, that's all right, we'll ask the head of the year to get you a new card and the head of the year came in and said, I said, oh, can he have a new car because his mum's washed his blazer? And the head of the year just looked at me deadpan in the face and said, no, he'll have to go off to the medical department and get a new car. If you send a kid down to the medical department, they get an instant detention. And I'm thinking, what? So the kid's going to get a detention because his mum's washed his blazer. What's that all about? And that's what happened. I went into complete and utter meltdown. Um, because it wasn't fair. And I was literally screaming at this lovely man who reacted really nicely. But that's just stupid. Why should he have a detention? He's got a clean blazer. He smells nice. What's going on in the world? And he went, I was joking. And I'm thinking, no, completely lost on me. So uh, that does cause me problems. Um, and I've probably caused the people around me more problems than myself. Sensory issues uh, in a neurotypical world. That's a staff briefing every week. I have to endure one of those. Uh, just a bunch of people stood around, somebody repeating something, three things at the front. That's what it's like to me. Blah, 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 blah. Because somebody's got Eve Sam the wrong perfume on and that's acid burning my nose. Somebody's got the shh, shh, shh. Somebody's just had a fag outside, somebody's playing on their mobile phone, somebody's having a talk about what they've been doing at the weekend, the kitchen smells of boiling cabbage, there's kids screaming on the corridor, the speakers are going, mm -hmm. someone's coughing, someone's sneezing. I can't hear, I don't pick up anything from it. And do you know what? I had to actually ask for them to send me the minutes of this compulsory meeting, auditory meeting. I said, it can't just be me. There must be deaf people that are having a problem with this. So, uh, yeah, you have to do that. My other one that gives me an issue is, okay, that, put that one on, is I, I don't know how you say this correctly, I stim. I do this. And when I'm listening, I really do this. I really like it. And I was doing this in the briefing the other day, like this, and I was having a right old good old rock, and I was really listening, and I was getting it, I was thinking, yeah, it's a good day to do it, and hear it. And this teacher grabbed hold of me, put his hands on my shoulders, and pushed me down to keep me still. I couldn't believe it. And then sometimes, I'll hum. <laughs> and I'm having a right little rock in my head, and people turn around and go, shh. I don't know I'm doing it. And I try to explain to people that there is a necessity to do that. And if I like something, I'm going to do it. 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 I'm going to do it
a good time. I'm going to get told off for doing that too. Bye adults. It's amazing. I'm really rubbish at looking at people's faces. Really rubbish. So I ask you all the time if you're alright. That loses me friends because I say, are you alright? Are you alright? I've got a really horrible habit of trying to fix everything. Autism pe autistic people don't like injustice. Asperger's people want to make the world right. And I will try. And when people tell me things, I will try and empathise with you. And I will give you an example to, to prove that I understand what you're saying. I will give you an example. But people think I'm trying to do one-upmanship. And I'm not. I'm not trying to be bigger or better. I'm just trying to say to you, I'm hearing you. I'm empathising with you. I'm trying to stay with you. As you can tell, I can't get to the point. I tell too much information. I do like a backstory. Um, I do like to tell you the whole backstory. If I'm telling you about something that's going wrong in my life, I want you to know all about the whole of the back of it. I can't do it without it. I can sum up, but I'm not very good at it. So, what was the diagnosis like for me? It was brilliant. It was frustrating. It was enlightening. I have learnt that some people don't make allowances for you, which is a good thing. They don't treat you like you're special. And then some people don't make allowances for you, and that's a bad thing, because they're not very nice. Okay? But that sums up my life. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason for what I'm doing. And the biggest problem I have, as an autistic person, is I don't like not black and white. I don't understand not black and white. I don't get grey areas. So if I was to sum up, it's quite hard being a black and white person in a world full of greyed areas. So your chance. And that's, that's the end of me and I'm really not good at finishing. Thanks very much.